Oh, what a day that will be. When Jesus, my Savior, I see. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 7 and continue our study through the Bible. Daniel tells us that this particular dream and vision came to him in the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, which means that Daniel at this time was probably somewhere around 84, 85 years old, still serving the Lord still an instrument of God, God speaking to him, yet of the future. He had a dream and a vision upon his bed, and he wrote the dream and sort of summed up the matters. He gave us now the summation uh, of the things that he saw in this vision, in this dream. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven were striving upon the great sea. In the scriptures, the sea is used as a symbol for the peoples of the nations. In the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, which is quite parallel uh, to this particular uh, vision that uh, he saw. In verse 15, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sits, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the seas quite often just represent the multitudes of people upon the earth. And what a apt picture of the world's population uh, as four winds are striving or blowing or creating this restlessness, this troubled sea. And the scriptures use the wicked, uh, the troubled seas as a symbol for the wicked who are like a troubled sea. And uh, if you've ever seen a sea in a, in a hurricane or in a storm, the troubled sea is just uh, no rest, just that restless energy that is there. And uh, thus he sees this four winds striving upon this great sea of humanity. And four great beasts came up from the sea that were diverse, one from another. The first was like a lion. It had eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, most Bible commentators see these four beasts as paralleling the four metals of the great image of Nebuchadnezzar. The head of gold representing the Babylonian Empire, replaced by the chest of silver representing the Medo-Persian Empire, replaced by the stomach of brass, the Grecian Empire, crushed by the legs of iron, the Roman Empire, and out of the Roman Empire coming the uh, two feet mixed of iron and clay with the ten toes, uh, that weakened revival of the Roman Empire in the last days. And uh, because there seems to be parallelisms uh, in these uh, consecutive kind of kingdoms that rule the world, most people see these as a parallel uh, of, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. There have been a few recently, not many, who see in these four beasts uh, kingdoms that would exist at the end of the world's present era, the end of the Gentile era. 
And thus they see the first one, the lion, as Great Britain or the British Empire uh, that uh, had the symbol of a lion. Uh, England has the symbol of the lion. And they see the empire, the wings being plucked, and thus the weakened condition of the once great British Empire. Uh, in the bear, of course, the bear has been the symbol of Russia. And so they see Russia as uh, the bear. And the leopard they see as a uh, federation of uh, Muslim nations that have net yet, yet not uh, actually come to pass. Uh, four of the major Muslim nations combining together. And then, of course, uh, the revival of the Roman Empire in the fourth beast. That is a possibility, and you must always uh, keep your mind open. Uh, one thing about prophecy, it is never completely and fully understood until it is completely fulfilled. And uh, so uh, we look at it and we say, well, it certainly appears to be this. And uh, I personally believe that the um, beasts are parallel to the nations, the kingdoms that um, parallel the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And we will look at it in that way. Thus the lion, uh, which of course, interestingly enough, uh, Isaiah as he prophesies of or Jeremiah, as he prophesies of the coming Babylonian kingdom, likens it as to a lion. Uh, in the palaces of the Babylonian uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the, they had these winged lions that uh, sort of guarded the gates to the palace, and thus Daniel, uh, being in the palace, would have seen them many times, and thus uh, the lion could well represent uh, the Babylonian kingdom. Uh, the uh, power of Babylon was taken, uh, and uh, of course the, uh, the man's heart given to it uh, could be a reference to uh, the change, the radical change that came to Nebuchadnezzar after his period of insanity and then the mellowing uh, from the great pride in all that he once had as he came to acknowledge that the God of heaven rules over the kingdoms of man. The second beast, like a bear, it raised itself up on one side, and the Medo-Persian Empire, they see it as it raising up on one side, the Persian Empire sort of uh, overshadowing uh, the uh, Mead. And it had three ribs in its mouth, and some see the three kingdoms that were conquered uh, by um, the uh, Medo Persian Empire, however, they conquered many more. And uh, the three ribs in the mouth between the teeth of it, and they said unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. Notice uh, that uh, these are wild kind of devouring, destroying animals. And uh, thus it fitly describes the, the kingdoms of man uh, that are basically leading to bloodshed, uh, leading to destruction. After this I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, and people see in this the Grecian Empire, uh, which had upon the back of it four wings, and uh, they interpret that as uh, the tremendous uh, speed with which Alexander the Great conquered the world. Uh, and uh, the beasts also had four heads. When Alexander the Great died at a very early age, there was not anyone in the kingdom that was powerful enough to assume uh, the rule over the whole Grecian Empire. And so the Grecian Empire at the death of Alexander the Great was divided unto four of the generals. And there came actually four powers 
out of the Grecian Empire, uh, that of Asia Minor, uh, that of uh, Syria and Egypt and Macedonia. So the four generals that uh, sort of divided the Grecian Empire and thus the four heads uh, that come out of it and dominion was given to it. Now in verse 7, you get a beast that is indescribable. Uh, he cannot liken it unto any beast of the forest. Uh, there was this fourth beast and it was just dread, uh, dreadful and terrible or awesome. It was exceedingly strong. It had a great iron teeth. Uh, of course, the iron of the symbol of uh, Rome in the vision or the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, which surely does uh, describe the Roman Empire and how it bludgeoned the world into submission. And it was diverse from all of the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns, uh, paralleling the ten toes uh, of the uh, dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And the final ten nations that will federate together in the last days uh, that will uh, be related in some way to the Roman Empire and very possibly the European community uh, will develop into this the federation of those kingdoms in Europe. Now I considered the horns, that is the ten horns, and behold, as, and the word considered is, I, I was looking steadfastly at, uh, sort of pondering, looking in amazement, and there came up among them another, that is an eleventh horn, a little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. And three times in the chapter he speaks of the mouth that speaks great things. So uh, one of the names for the Antichrist could be Big Mouth, but... Uh, <laughs> He is known by many different names, son of perdition, uh, the beast, uh, the antichrist, and the man of sin, and uh, is known by many different titles. But I beheld or was watching till the thrones were cast down, the kingdoms of man brought to an end. And the Ancient of Days, that is, God the Father, did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, and thousand thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. Thousand thousands would be millions. 10,000 times 10,000 would be a hundred million. In Revelation chapter 5, uh, we find uh, John as he beheld the throne of God and uh, he gives us... Uh, Somewhat a similar picture. Verse 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. And the beasts, which in this place uh, are the living creatures, the cherubim and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands or hundred million plus millions saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive the power riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing so uh, uh, we we see the uh, similar uh, scene in the book of Revelation John saw it as Daniel saw it 
and uh, sort of parallel types of uh, visions as they behold the throne of God. Can you picture that? Can you picture this awesome throne of God with the millions upon millions of angelic beings, a hundred million plus millions of millions. So the books were open. It could be the scroll is referred to here. In the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation, John sees a scroll sealed with seven seals, writing both on the inside and the outside of it. He hears a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice, who is worthy to take this scroll and loose the seals? And when no one was found worthy to take the scroll, John began to sob until the elder said unto him, Weep not, John, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to take the seals uh, the book and loose the seals. And he saw Jesus as he came forth and took the scroll out of the right hand of the Father sitting upon the throne. And it was at that time that this worship and praise arose to Christ from the hundred million plus millions of angels. And so uh, the, the passages are parallel in that the scroll is the title deed to the earth. When it is open, Chapter 10, Jesus comes with the open book or the open scroll, puts one foot upon the sea, one upon the land, and he proclaims the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Messiah. And therein is the glorious day that we're anticipating and looking forward to when God's kingdom comes and his will is done on the earth even as it is in heaven. So this has to do with that same period of time uh, when the Lord sets up his kingdom and his righteous reign over the earth. The books were open. And I beheld then because of the voice of the great words, and here we have the, the, the horn, the eleventh horn, which plucked up three. Uh, it means that when the Antichrist comes into power, Three of the nations that form a part of this ten-nation confederacy will be rooted out, and he will take their place and then take over, take control. And I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. The, the Antichrist, he, he watched it until the Antichrist was was slain and his body was cast into Gehenna to the burning flame. If you will turn to Revelation chapter 20. And just before chapter 20 is chapter 19 and that's the one I want. Verse 20. <laughs> and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought the miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And so he watched until his body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. Inasmuch as we are going to be looking at the Antichrist, here in Daniel chapter 7, just to give us some other background, turn to the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, and there we read concerning the Antichrist, and you will see the parallelisms between John's uh, writings and that of Daniel. I stood upon the sand of the sea. He saw these beasts coming up out of the sea in Daniel. I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, or diadems, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So these great things that he says are actually 
great words of blasphemy against God. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard. He had feet like a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. And so we have there the, 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 the first three kingdoms sort of combined. Uh, the lion, the bear, and uh, the leopard are sort of combined in this final uh, little horn or the Antichrist. And the dragon, that is Satan, gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Now you remember that when Jesus came to the earth, the purpose of the coming of Jesus Christ was to redeem the world back to God. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth belonged to God by divine right of creation. He created it, it was his. When God created man and placed man upon the earth, God gave the earth to man. God said, have dominion over the earth, over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over every moving and creeping thing, for I have given it unto you. So God gave to man a, a glorious gift, this beautiful earth. And God commissioned Adam to take care of it, to dress it, uh, to, to groom it. But then when Adam disobeyed God and followed the temptation offered by Satan and ate of the forbidden fruit, Adam in reality turned the world in that action over to Satan. Know ye not that whomsoever you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you become, whether it be of unrighteousness unto sin or of, uh, or of righteousness unto God, whoever you yield yourself servants to obey, you become their servants. Adam yielded himself to obey Satan's suggestion. He became then a servant of Satan, and the world at that time was forfeited over to Satan by Adam, and now it was under Satan's control. The purpose of the coming of Jesus was to take the world back, to redeem the world back, that it might again once more be God's who made it in the beginning. You remember that when Jesus was baptized by John and he was then led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days when he fasted, afterwards he was hungry and Satan came to him and tempted him, first of all, to turn the stones into bread. And then he took him to a high mountain, and he showed him all of the kingdoms of the world. And he said unto Jesus, I will give unto you all of these and the glory of them if you will just bow down and worship me. Now Jesus came to redeem the world back to God. Satan is offering to give it up without a fight, without a struggle. All you have to do is bow down and worship me, and I will give it to you. But Jesus came to pay the price that was demanded. He came to go to the cross and there pay the price of redemption. We are redeemed not with corruptible things such as silver and gold from our empty lives, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ who was slain as a lamb without spot or blemish. And so Jesus did not dispute Satan's claim to own the world. They are mine, he said. I can give them to whomever I will. He boasted that to Jesus. Jesus didn't challenge that boast. He recognized that this world system belonged to Satan, that Adam had forfeited it to Satan. And Jesus twice called Satan the prince of this world. 
That is why it is so manifestly wrong to blame God for all of the tragedies that are happening in the world today. The tragedies are happening because the world is in rebellion against God's law. The world is under Satan's power. It continues to be. And when the Antichrist comes on the scene, according to Revelation 13 here, verse 2, the dragon will give to the Antichrist his power, his throne, and great authority. And so what he promised to give to Jesus, he will give to this Antichrist, this man of sin, son of perdition, in the last days. I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. His deadly wound was healed, and all of the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, Satan worship, in the last days, who gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things. There we have the big mouth again. <laughs> and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue for a space of 42 months. Or two and a, three and a half years. 1,260 days. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme the name of God. They blasphemed the tabernacle and those who dwelled in heaven. At that time, you'll be dwelling there, so he'll blaspheme you as you're dwelling, those Christians, you know. Oh, what a time the world is going to have when we go. <laughs> Phil Donahue is going to have a big thing over this. <laughs> And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. The saints there not being the church, but Israel, the Jews, with whom God will be dealing in this last seven-year period of time. Power was given to him over all of the families and tongues and nations, and they that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. And he that leads into captivity will go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. So a description there of the Antichrist. Now in Revelation 17, in order that we might get the total or a, a broader scriptural view, not the total, but broader, there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and he talked with me saying unto me, come hither, I will show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth and the great whore is the false prophet. It is the apostate church, uh, not the true church, the apostate church that will join forces with the Antichrist in leading the world to worship him with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast that was full of names of blasphemy, having, and here it is, seven heads, ten horns. So we recognize this from uh, both Daniel and from chapter 13. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great wonderment. And the angel said unto me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast which you saw was and is not. He shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. He will go into Gehenna. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written 
in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains upon which the woman sits. And there are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other is not yet to come. When he comes, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and he is of the seven, he goes into perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. Uh, but they receive power as kings for one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, the waters which you saw where the horse sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. They shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is the great city, uh, Rome, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So we'll get to that uh, when we get to Revelation. But uh, you think I'm not going to live that long. I'm going to surprise you. So he, he Daniel, coming back to Daniel now, chapter uh, 7, verse 11, I beheld because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and given, his body destroyed and given to the burning flame, cast into Gehenna. As concerning the rest of the beast, that is the lion, bear, and so forth, they had their dominion taken away, their power was taken away, and yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Now, Babylon still exists. Today it is called Iraq. Persia still exists. Today it is called Iran. Greece still exists. So these three kingdoms still exist, but no great power anymore. They are uh, just uh, minor uh, powers in the world today, and yet they still do exist to the present day, though uh, not as powerful uh, kingdoms as they once were in history. Now, Daniel said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, and here we come back now to this uh, uh, vision of the coming of Jesus Christ, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Jesus said immediately after the tribulation of those days shall they see the sign of the Son of Man coming with clouds and great glory. Here in the night visions I beheld one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and he came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him and there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. These other dominions have passed away, not his. His kingdom is that which shall not be destroyed as the other kingdoms were destroyed. Turn with me to Psalm 2, a prophetic psalm. The psalmist asked, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? For the kings of the earth have set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. 
the rebellion of man against the laws of God. Let's cast away the laws of God. Let's cast away the restraints that God has placed in his laws. It is interesting that our Supreme Court has ruled that it is unconstitutional to even have the Ten Commandments posted in the public schools. Let's cast away his laws. They have taken counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed Jesus Christ. And they've determined that they are not to have any influence over our national life. Let's break their bands asunder. Let's cast away their cords from us. But he that sits in the heaven, and God looks down and he sees, you know, these men plotting, and he sees the ACLU, and, and he sees the Supreme Court, and uh, this rebellion in man's heart against him. And what's he do? He laughs. Foolish man. The Lord shall have them in derision. We see that. And then he shall speak unto them in his wrath, and he will vex them in his sore displeasure. God will speak in the great tribulation. He will allow man to see what will be the consequences when a righteous influence is removed from the earth. Right now, hell would like to break forth all over the earth. The men of the world are straining against the, 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 the bit, the, the ropes. They, evil is wanting to just flood the earth. The Antichrist wants to take over. But the church, weak as it is, the influence of the righteous following after the Lord is withholding that unrestrained evil. As with Abraham, as he was talking to God about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, should not the Lord of the earth be fair? What if there are 50 righteous people in Sodom would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And the Lord said, if I find 50 righteous, I will spare the city. What if there's only 45? I'll spare it for 45. What if there's only 40? I'll spare it for 40. What if there's only 10? I'll spare it for 10. And God is sparing the world his judgment today because of the church. And though we are weak, as the Lord said to the Church of Philadelphia, you have a little strength, not much, but still a little, and enough that God is sparing the world his judgment until as he took Lot out of Sodom and then the judgment came, so when the Lord takes out his church, the judgment will come. And people who have been Bashing Christians, and that's a popular sport today in the media. Every time they get a chance, they love to bash the Christians. And especially you rotten fundamentalists who are trying to impose your strict, rigid convictions on the whole world. You know, you're evil. <laughs> oh. And oh, how they love to get on that bandwagon. And how they would love to get rid of you fundamentalists who believe the Bible and who believe God's word is true. And one day, we're going to give them what they desire. <laughs> the Lord's going to remove his church out of this world. And then they will find out just what they've been wishing and longing for, but they will quickly discover it's not what they want. As the judgments of God began to fall against the unbridled evil of man, 
and, and we see this period of great tribulation such as the world has never seen before. So God will uh, actually, uh, verse 5 there, he'll speak to them in his wrath. That is, he'll speak to them in the judgments that come, and he will vex them in his sore displeasure. And that yet the Lord said, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, they'll see the Son of Man coming with clouds and great glory to establish God's kingdom. And God will set his king, Jesus Christ, upon the holy hill of Zion. And I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me. Here's the Lord speaking to his son. He, he said unto him, You are my son. This day I have begotten thee. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And he says, Ask of me. And I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. And you will break them with a rod of iron and you will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So um, be wise now, the psalmist exhorts us. O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverence and rejoicing and trembling. Kiss the son, that is, kiss his scepter. That was a sign of submission and, and yielding and obedience to the king. You would come, he'd hold out his scepter, you would kiss the scepter as a sign of your submission to his lordship over your life. Kiss the son. Surrender yourself to the lordship of Jesus, lest he be angry and you perish with the world around you when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. We pray thy kingdom come and those prayers shall be answered. God's kingdom shall come to this earth. His king shall reign. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So I saw in the night visions, back to Daniel again, chapter 7, verse 13. And behold, one like the Son of Man, he came with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given, God gave to him, the dominion and the glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now, this is the vision that Daniel saw. And the result of it was, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Daniel was wondering, what is this all about? What does this mean? Notice it was in the first year of Belshazzar. Daniel was close to Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar had had a real a conversion type of experience as acknowledged in the fourth chapter as he praises and extols the God of heaven. Uh, when the son of Belshazzar took over, he didn't reign long and he was soon assassinated, but he seems to have followed his father's faith in the living God of Israel. And it was at that time that he took Jeconiah out of prison and began to give him a favored position in Babylon. Uh, but when Belshazzar came to the throne, here's a young guy. He's not really old enough to have the responsibility of the whole kingdom. And he starts making some foolish uh, moves. And uh, he starts inaugurating some ridiculous kind of laws. And uh, 
Daniel probably thought, what in the world is going to happen to the kingdom now? You know, this young guy in there doing all these foolish things, much like probably you're thinking now, what's going to happen <laughs> to the United States now, you know? Go home, maybe the Lord will give you a dream. Uh, but uh, it was probably just this, uh, you know, unquestioned future. I mean, the questionable future because of the character of Belshazzar and the Lord is responding to Daniel, showing him actually what the future holds. But he was grieved in his spirit. The visions troubled him. He didn't understand them. And so I came near unto one of them that stood by. Now, uh, in, uh, there were probably angels, or in the book of Revelation, there were elders. When John saw the visions uh, in the book of Revelation and John didn't understand what was going on, the elders would oftentimes explain to him what was going on. When uh, no one could take the scroll and loose the seals and John began to sob, the elder, one of the elders said, don't weep, John, just hold on a minute, watch now, you know. The line of the tribe of Judah, he's going to prevail and he'll take the scroll. You don't have to cry about it. I mean, God's got it all in control. And uh, at other times, the angels uh, would explain to uh, John a little more fully the visions that he was seeing. Here was one standing by, probably an angel, and Daniel goes up and he asks him the truth of all this. What does all this mean? So he told me, and he made me to know the interpretation of the things. For these great beasts, which are four, are four kings or kingdoms, which shall arise out of the earth. Now, this is a very brief... <laughs> You talk about a very brief summation. Daniel said, I give you the summation. This is a very brief summation of the, of the vision. Is that these four beasts are four kings that are going to rise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever, even forever and ever. So uh, these are the kingdoms of man uh, that will reign for a period of time, but ultimately... The kingdom will belong to the saints and they shall reign forever and ever. Uh, as in Revelation, as we uh, hear the worship of Jesus unto him who loved us and gave himself for us, uh, and uh, he has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign with him upon the earth. The kingdom will be given to the saints forever and ever. Right now, Satan is in control. Right now, the powers of darkness are holding sway. But there is coming a glorious day in the future when the kingdom will be given unto the Lord and unto his followers, the saints. That's the brief summation. So now Daniel wanted more. Tell me then, he said, uh, I like to know the truth about this fourth beast. That's the one that Daniel was really fascinated by, which was different from the others. He was exceeding dreadful. His teeth were like iron, his nails like brass, and he devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. And I, what about those 10 horns that were in his head? And of the other one, that 11th one that came up, before whom three of them fell, even that horn that had eyes and a mouth, there he is the mouth again, that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. What about that uh, 11th horn that rose up and, and all? And I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Now, in Revelation chapter 13 that we read earlier, uh, we read that uh, the uh, Antichrist uh, made uh, war with the saints, verse 7, given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Here it says he prevailed against them, made war and prevailed against them. The... words of Jesus to Peter when Peter acknowledged that he was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. 
Jesus said to Peter, Blessed art thou, for flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. I say unto you that you are Petros, a little stone, but upon this rock, Petra, I will build my church. What rock? The confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. He's the Messiah. That's the foundation of the church. And Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That is why the saints could not be the church, because the Antichrist does prevail against the saints. And as we further study the reign of the Antichrist, and as you look at it in chapter 12, he makes war against Israel, and uh, many of them are slain. Those that escape, escape down to Moab, where they are protected for a period of time in the rock city of Petra. But that's in another lesson, and we'll get that at some other time but you can just file it away in your minds for a while. For he said the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom. Uh, well, I beheld, the, and he made war with the saints, prevailed against them until he will rule until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And uh, come, ye blessed of the Father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundations of the world. And thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which will be diverse from all kingdoms and will devour the whole earth. In the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, we find the whole world being dominated by the Antichrist. And he shall tread it down break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them and he will be diverse, that is the Antichrist, the eleventh horn, be diverse from the first and he will subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words, again the great words, but this time against the Most High, the blasphemies against God, and he will wear out the saints, the Jews of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times and a dividing of a time, or three and a half years, uh, he will have this power over uh, the, the world and uh, over the Jews. When we get to the ninth chapter, a couple of weeks from now, uh, we will read again of the Antichrist, and we will see the seven-year total reign uh, divided into two three-and-a-half-year periods. And the first part will be a deception. The Jews will be deceived uh, and will acclaim him as Savior until, of course, he reveals his true colors, and uh, then they will flee to the wilderness. He will seek to destroy them and... Uh, the, he will make war against them and prevail until his time is up, three and a half years. But he will think to change the times and the laws. Uh, a lot of that is being done today, changing of the laws, uh, opening the door for more evil to uh, spread uh, its cancer over the world. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy unto the end. Uh, judgment will prevail, God's judgment. And the powers of the Antichrist will be taken away, and he will be consumed and destroyed. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints and of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all of the dominion shall serve and obey him. The glorious reign of Jesus Christ over the whole world, reigning with the saints, the Old Testament saints, as well as the church of Jesus Christ, reigning with him. 
Daniel said, hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations trouble me much. My countenance was changed in me, but I just kept the matter in my heart. I mean, he was puzzled by it. He, he, he was troubled by it, but he just pondered it and kept it in his heart, uh, these things that God had revealed unto him. Of course, they were not for Daniel to really know. When we get to the 12th chapter of the book of Daniel, and Daniel is asking some questions about the vision, the Lord said, just seal it up, Daniel. It's for the last days. You know, and, and uh, in the last days, knowledge will be increased. Uh, people will then begin to understand as they see these events. And, and as I said, prophecy, once it's fulfilled, it becomes very clear. And so these things are for the last days. Knowledge will be increased. They will understand it. You're not really writing for yourself. It isn't really necessary for you to know these things. The rapture of the church. People say, well, it's a doctrine that just, you know, it isn't a part of historic church doctrine. It's, it's something that is really rather recent. Uh, you know, back in 100 years ago, uh, with the Plymouth Brethren, this doctrine came out, uh, Darby and uh, popularized by Schofield and so forth. And, and it's a recent doctrine. And, and so they tried to pass it off as, uh, you know, irrelevant uh, to uh, true doctrine, that it's just something that has come up of late. Well, again, in the last days, knowledge will be increased. Why should Luther be given revelation concerning the rapture of the church when it isn't going to take place in his lifetime? Or Zwingli or Calvin or the others. You see, they weren't to understand or to know. But in the last days, knowledge will be increased. As the time approaches, the Lord will give us then an understanding of these things. And really, they aren't new. Paul wrote about the rapture of the church. That's not new. And that surely is a part of church history. Uh, but they just didn't have the understanding until the time when we need to have the vital understanding has come because the rapture is very near. Thus, the Lord opens our understanding to these things. So um, Daniel was troubled. Didn't understand it, wrote it down. But it really was sealed until these days as now we see these things happening and we begin to understand more clearly, more fully the plan of God for this world. And we see us in the final stages of world history under Gentile control. It began with Nebuchadnezzar, but it's just about run its course. And soon the world will again be under the control of Jesus Christ and God's people. It'll be a new world, a glorious true new age in which the Lord will reign in his eternal kingdom. Father, we thank you for your word, your sure word of prophecy. Lord, these sayings are faithful and true, and you have affirmed the truth. And Lord, our hearts rejoice we find comfort and consolation in the hope of your coming kingdom, Lord, as the world is in such a desperate, dark condition, as evil days are waxing worse and worse. Lord, as wickedness is prevailing, Lord, our hearts yearn for a day of righteousness and the righteous reign of Jesus. And Lord, as we read the newspapers and the news magazines, and we see the terrible, horrible things that are happening in our United States, we wonder, Lord, when will the world see that we need Jesus? 
Oh Lord, when will the Jews cry, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Lord, how we pray that you will hasten that day of your coming, taking your church out of this world that blasphemes you, drawing us unto yourself, Lord, and getting into the glorious eternal reign. But Lord, help us, even as you've told us to have patience, to establish our hearts, knowing, Lord, that you have a purpose and a plan, and that you're waiting for the complete fruit of harvest. Lord, bring in that complete fruit quickly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? May the Lord be with you and watch over you and keep you in his love. May the Spirit of God just fill your life to overflowing. May you experience the wonderful fruit of the Spirit, God's love flowing out from you to a world that so desperately needs to know the Savior. May his love through you allow them to see God's love for them. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Get it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory Yeah.